my name is Zoe Fischer and I am a scientist at the European Spallation Source in Lund, Sweden. I am by training a protein crystallographer, but my job now at ESS is to actually lead a laboratory support service for the user community. Here we support users uh, with making the proper sample for their beam time. I was born and raised in Cape Town, South Africa, and I completed undergraduate studies there. But at the age of 24, I moved to the United States, where I lived and worked for 13 years. So I'm also a citizen of the United States of America. And after that uh, time, uh, we as a family relocated here to Sweden, where we have been now for nine years. So proteins are molecules found in living systems. They can have various functions. They may be structural, like the kinds of proteins that make up your muscles, for example, to the kinds of proteins that are more molecular machines, uh, and those we call enzymes. And they really catalyze all the essential uh, reactions that make living systems work. So for a lot of the work we do as crystallographers, we focus on enzymes. It does this conversion of CO2 to bicarbonate a million times per second. It is incredibly fast enzyme. It is like the Ferrari or Lamborghini of, of enzymes. And there's very few other enzymes that work at that kind of speed. So there's been a lot of interest in how this small, folded up little protein can actually accelerate this reaction so rapidly. A million per second is a staggering rate. If you dissolve CO2 in a glass of water, the rate is extremely slow the natural conversion. The enzyme is able to accelerate that conversion almost 10 to the 8 times. Uh, the specific activity that, that it does, this conversion of CO2 to bicarbonate ion, involves water molecules and also protons, where protons are H plus ions. They're essentially a hydrogen that has lost that one orbiting electron, leaving you only with the proton and um, the nature of X-rays and how they interact with the elements found in protein crystals is that they really don't see, they don't react at all to um, hydrogen atoms. So proteins are about 50% uh, hydrogen atoms. And so 50%, half of the information in your sample you typically don't see with X-rays. But with a series of systematic neutron studies under varying conditions, we were able to actually see 100% of all the atoms. So it allowed us to really refine the model of how we think the enzyme works, and that we could not have done without uh, going to large neutron facilities uh, to do that. We come to these kinds of facilities because of the power of the facility. We can get uh, a lot of data, a lot of measurements in a short amount of time. For neutrons, it's even more special because you do not have uh, laboratory sources. You cannot buy a commercial system that you can set up in a university lab. You really do need to come to these big facilities to use them uh, for your research. So a really basic model of an atom is that in the center of the atom, in the nucleus, you have an arrangement of protons and neutrons, and circling around them in orbits are electrons. Um, and this number of protons and neutrons and electrons vary if you look across the periodic table. Uh, an interesting example is hydrogen atom, in that it only has a proton in the nucleus and one electron orbiting, so it does not have a neutron. But if we add a neutron to the hydrogen nucleus, we end up with an isotope of hydrogen called deuterium. And if we add another neutron, so now we have two neutrons in the atomic nucleus, we end up with tritium. And all these things are different isotopes of the hydrogen atom. And they differ by the number of neutrons in the nucleus.
I spent a lot of energy and effort uh, on these kind of activities to try and recruit future users, whether it is from pharmaceutical companies to other academic researchers, uh, is really to promote the idea of using neutrons as a complementary tool uh, to their existing work.